Kia ora. Uh, mai ngā kūria whārei ki tihirau, ko mā tātua toku waka ko toroa te tangata, ko pūtāki toku maunga, ko rangitaiki toku awa, ko nā te awa te iwi, ko te patuai o mō tēti me, te pahi poto nā hapū, uh, ko heni mā te oro, mā te haere, raua ko pōmāre paura o ko mātua, ko atareta paura ahau. Um, kia ora, so... <laughs> Just a, uh, it's not translation, just a little bit of, a, um, of what I just said in my mihi is that I'm Adrian Paul, I'm from Mōtiti through my mother and I'm from Te Teko in the Bay of Plenty through my father um, and I, kind of, I just hold all of that uh, knowledge from my parents and their parents um, being brought up by my parents and so <laughs> just let you know that from a personal side that's where I'm from from my um, professional side, I'm a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law at Canterbury University. I also practice in law as a lawyer, in, firstly in family law, but mainly in Māori land law um, and moving into mental health court. So I use that to actually bring into my teaching um, and I also sit as a independent commissioner, RMA commissioner for ministry. Uh, for the environment. So I'm only brand new in that section, but um, it makes sense to me to be there. So uh, thank you so much to the organisers for letting me talk about this kaupapa um, so that I can connect me to the actual sustainable seas. I'm a part of the 4.2 project, which is the legislation and policy to enable EBM with Eric and Liz, who's led that project. Um, and so I bought the I'm the Māori researcher on that project, which comes with the Te Ao Māori and legal perspective for that, um, all of the writings there. Ka pai? Okay. So that's me. I need to place myself um, so that you know the context of who I am when I'm talking about the research here. Okay. So in law, it's all about context, and so I'm going to put it into context in relation to the research that I've done uh, through my PhD, and so putting it into context, I used a mi mixed methodology. Mixed methodology is putting two methods for research together, and I've used kopapa Māori and qualitative legal research. Everyone understands kopapa Māori research method? Using things for Māori by Māori with Māori, uh, and for qualitative legal research, that's looking at the historical backgrounds, the history of the people um, through the use of legislation, statute, case law, all those legal documents. So together, bringing everything together combined, it should be a mixed combined method that honours the mana of indigenous peoples, community and knowledge to demonstrate the advantages or disadvantages of legal frameworks on Indigenous peoples. Did everyone follow that? That meaning Māori here in Aotearoa. And then further, my people on Mōtiti. So that's the context in which I um, provide this kōrero. So why, why am I even looking at um, the question? Sorry, haven't finished. The question is, what lessons can Aotearoa New Zealand learn from the Envy Rena oil spill disaster that occurred here in the Bay of Plenty? That's the question that I'm answering, and the aim of that is to understand how to deal with environmental disasters from a whānau, hapu and iwi perspective. Okay. Why did I even go to this question? Basically because I whakapapa to Mōtiti. Mōtiti Island was the closest um, that impacted from the Enverena oil disaster uh, and that's really the reasoning behind that because I whakapapa to it. Um, also Mōtiti is a, it's not infrastructure, no roads, no lights on there, it's pure fun from my perspective because um, you just go there, you relax, you escape from your everyday life, you spend time with your whānau and uh, you do fishing, diving etc. So my parents always took us back to the island so that we stayed grounded with our people, our belief system, our culture. And I say that because 
I, I wasn't born on the island. I was brought up in Auckland because mum and dad went with the urbanisation shift into the city, but they always brought us back to the island to keep grounded. For us, our island's really important. The ocean is our food cupboard. Um, there's nowhere else to go because we're on an isolated island. There's no shops on there. So um, you have to be careful with your food and uh, just managing uh, your household. And along with that is that we respect Tangaroa, the god of the sea, by keeping the beaches clean. And in return, Tangaroa gives to us our kaitiaki. So we have many more kaitiaki, um, but today I'm sharing with you the ones that my mum told me about, which are the oral traditions about our two stingray. And what, there are a couple. There is a female stingray and a male stingray. The female is the black one and the male one is the white stingray. So the story goes that the female guides the male stingray around the island as they look after it because he's blind and she's there to support him. And mum always said that this reflects to our people on the island. And um, can I, I can believe that because the women are quite boisterous and loud <laughs> and our men are really humble and relaxed and reserved. So um, I'll always cherish those stories mum passed on. Our belief system on the island comes from, and I'm sure some of you may know the creation story, right? The creation story of Te Kore Kore where Rangi and Papa existed and had their uh, supernatural children, which were all uh, supposed to be male, um, male forms in supernatural, which are Tane, uh, God of the forest, uh, Tangaroa, God of the sea, etc. So that family is what we see as the environmental family, and they help guide us through what we need to do in terms of the island. But from that family was Tane, who had a union with, with Hiniahu One, um, who was made from Papatūnuku, and that union produced uh, the first human being, which is Hini Titama. And so that's the whakapapa line uh, that, that we believe in, that connects us directly to the environment uh, in terms of the creation story, generally. Kaupai? Yeah. So from there, specifically, straight to Mōtiti itself and Ōtaiti, which is the Astrolab Reef, our oral traditions from there starts at our Urupa. So our Urupa is on a cliffside facing out towards Otaiti Astrolab Reef. And when our loved ones pass away, they jump off the cliff onto the stepping stones of Otaiti and onto Hawaikinui. So that is our spiritual pathway back home. Does everyone understand that? Um, a part of that is that our kaumātua go out to Astrolab Reef to Karakia, which is giving respect to Tangaroa and to make way for that spiritual pathway to keep it clear. So those are our customary practices that are um, performed out there to keep things nice and clear and on the way home. So the reason why I'm explaining this is because the legal issue that came through is that there is an Enverena ship sitting on all Taiti, blocking the way home. And that's always been the argument from Te Patuai on more Titi. Okay. So keep that in mind as I walk through the rest of the kōrero, because that's the actual issue that has been occurring. Right. So we have, in 2011, as everyone from here would know, we had the MV Rena vessel strike or struck Astrolab Reef for Taiti um, on the route from Napier to Tauranga and caused serious damage to the hull, um, causing a lot of impact of oil, equipment and debris in the surrounding marine uh, environment. Uh, the MV Rena is a container ship, really large, really it's in length for 
rugby fields in length and um, 236 metres is that length. So holding 1,368 containers of goods uh, that spread across the ocean and holding 1,733 tonnes of heavy fuel oil, which is like that thick substance on the, on the roads when it melts at, on a hot day. It's, it's that thick, or was that thick. So in terms of its location, it's uh, four nautical miles from Mortiti out to Otaiti, and then 12 nautical miles from the coastline out towards Otaiti. And this is the reason why we're talking about Mortiti, because we were the closest that um, had the most impact. Does everyone see how close? Yep. So in terms of the environmental uh, impact, it caused the, well, of course everyone will know because it's been on media, but it caused immense oil spreading across from Otaiti straight over to Motiti because it was the closest and then went as far up to um, the Coromandel Peninsula, down through Hauraki and then across Tauranga and as far as Takaha. So it, did, it just moved up with the tides and then came all the way down. That was the oil, but also the containers and the goods that were inside of those containers went across the, um, the seabed as well. So just remember, it's not just an oil spill, it was oil and debris and the equipment. So how did they respond? Of course, it was a three-tier response from Maritime New Zealand, who has the role of um, not delivering those response mechanisms for the government. Uh, they approached it, uh, I don't know if it was quickly, because just to pause here, at the time that the MV Rena struck, Remember that year Canterbury had the earthquakes, so the government was already dealing with that uh, disaster there about three months before the RENA came. So if you think about that in terms of the pressure on government and the legal systems, they were already under pressure and then this occurred. Uh, but it was Maritime New Zealand who um, delivered out those response mechanisms as well as the uh, regional council. So it involved a clean-up um, across the board in terms of your whānau hapu iwi communities, government agencies, non-organisations um, were involved, as well as um, university institutes who sent out students to help as well. Uh, and also the businesses that were across Tauranga. All right. So what was happening while everyone was cleaning up? So in terms of the legal uh, mechanisms, what happened? Basically, Maritime New Zealand issued the two notices for the MV Rena owner to remove the, sh the full wreck removal of the Rena vessel under the Maritime Transport Act. Then from there, it went to the Crown and the MV Rena negotiations uh, to deal with the disaster and as a result from that was uh, signed, negotiated and signed of um, three settlements or settlement deeds. So those three settlement deeds didn't have Māori input in that discussion where it should have and because of that it resulted in a Waitangi Tribunal urgent inquiry. And then from that um, Waitangi Tribunal urgent inquiry the issue there was that the Crown had to decide whether or not it would support the MV Renner's uh, owner's resource consent application. And if they did, then the government would get 10.4 million. And the result of that was that the Crown did end up um, going forward and received the 10.4 million. That was the actual breach under Te Tiriti o Waitangi because Māori was not at that table um, with those decision-making um, mechanisms there. So 
the findings from the Waitangi Tribunal there was that the government had to pay for the funding of Māori to participate in the resource consent application process. So I'm just going to pause there for a bit because there's about, I'm talking about three different institutions and three different processes all happening at the same time. So first we had the Maritime New Zealand process to, to have a full rec removal, okay? It was one process, one institution, one legislation. Then there's the Waitangi Tribunal, which is another institution for the breach um, that occurred by the Crown by not having Māori at the table. And then beside that is the resource consent process under the Resource Management Act. So those three are all sim simultaneously occurring at the same time. Um, and that's really important to note from a legal perspective because from a legal mind you can, you can tell straight away that there are, there's a lot of money that's involved, you need lawyers to help with the process, you need to have consultation, you need whānau hapu iwi in that consultation process and decisions have to be made. So it's really compounding. Does everyone agree? Yeah. So just saying that, as a result of the resource consent application process, it was granted in 2016. Okay. So just to talk about the resource consent, because it was granted um, under two kind of, not themes, but two points. We have one that allowed the ship to be abandoned on Otaiti, its equipment, cargo and debris. And then the second one was to permit further discharge of contaminants um, from the MV Rena. And the reason why that's there is because the, even though the Rena's there, it's sitting on a slant, but there's contamination or contaminants underneath the ship. Over time, uh, gradual time will go past, the ship will slide down, contaminants will gradually come out. So that's what the second resource consent's there for. And then the first one's just to let it sit there. What do you guys think? <laughs> it is. And just remember how, what I said about the legal issue, that there's a ship sitting on the pathway to Hawaii Nui. Okay. So the scope of that resource consent is that it's there for monitoring, monitoring the effects or changes to Otaiti. It's also there to, for recovery if there is impairment that occurs. And it's also there to establish two groups for advisory, advisory groups. You've got the KRG, which is the Kaitiaki Tanga Resource or Reference Group. Then you've got ITAG, which is the Independent Technical Advisory Group. That's your science. And then cultural on, on one side. They're meant to advise the consent holder, which is the MV Rena owner, and also uh, regional council as well. It's there for a term of 10 years, and it'll expire in two years' time, so 2026. Okay. And at the time that it expires, the MV Rena owner will be released of its obligations and responsibilities, and then that will pass over to regional council, and so obviously there'll need to be some kind of relationship occurring there. No, and, so I, I had to laugh for that because it's, yeah. Well, it just seems dumb because if I was here and I was a race power, I'd be really annoyed that now my race had actually got to go into something that belongs to a private enterprise. Yeah. Mm. That's actually just how the law goes, really, because when that consent holder is released of their obligations, the person or the entity that governs you know, the ocean from 12 nautical miles out from the coastline is actually the council, the regional council. So hence it, why it moves to the regional council and then they've got to um, look after it, right? What that looks like, I have no idea. I mean, I've got some ideas, but I don't really know what will happen after that. So, yeah. So I think you said the Hutton sort of kind of was consulted in the resource consent process. No, no, no. That, so the Waitangi Tribunal had no consultation for Māori. The resource consent process 
you don't, it's not a cons consultation, it's basically participation. So did we, did Pano, did the Hapu participate in the Rena consultation? Yeah, yeah. Were they in favour of the Rena staying there? No, no. Okay. No, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about that because, no, no, you're all good, you're sparking my brain here. So <laughs> when we get to the resource consent process, it is participation for Fano, Hapu and Iwi, right? And they go there to say, no, we want full rec removal, because that's what you said in the last, uh, you know, under the other legislation. But because we're in a different legislation with a different process, those are the only rules that you go under. So Māori went into there. The outcome of that process really kind of split us in two. I'm not sure if you saw the media, but half of our uh, Fano and the island ended up kind of tracked they tracked back and thought, yeah, okay, maybe, well, we're in the process, so let's try and do something with the RMA. And then the other half were like, no, we want full rec removal because that's what was agreed to before. So our people were split in half over that, and that was uh, as a result of the legal proceedings that were occurring. Because once you get lawyers, I'm not saying lawyers are bad because I am one, <laughs> but once you get lawyers involved, lawyers do what they need to do to make the arguments for their clients. So if the clients are saying we want it for this, that's what they'll do. And that's good because they're doing the job. But then if the other half of our people are saying, no, we want full rec removal, then lawyers, lawyers will have to make the argument. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good question. <laughs> so in the Maritime Act, and I need to double check this, but I think on the last provision, um, the Envy Rena owner actually saw in the last provision in one of the sections that there was a, a liner that said, and if necessary, it could go through a resource management, uh, a resource application process under the Resource Management Act 1991. So it was one provision that allowed it to go under a different process <coughs> that I never saw. <laughs> In terms of... Because if it says it can, then someone's got to make the decision that... that yeah, so that'll be the director of um, Maritime New Zealand. Okay. Yeah, and they would have had, uh, the Envy Arena owner would have had discussions with them to Enter. rectify yeah. Yeah, what happened in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't comment on that, but it makes sense. It makes sense, right? Yeah. So that's why it went shifted under the RMA. Yeah. And then we were kind of stuck there. Yeah. Okay. So what were the challenges for Mortiti going through this whole process? And just outlining that the whole PhD thesis is going from the disaster right to the decision that was made at the hearing panel, okay? Because there were other legal proceedings that I didn't want to go into, so I just stopped at the um, council hearing. So the challenges that Maltese had was actually, the top of the list was understanding the process. Um, I was only going through law school at the moment, so I was like a baby in law school, so I didn't really understand myself. I could understand what was meant to happen, but we needed to get more information to understand what's the maritime Transport Act and how do we go through that and then how did we get over to the RMA? Oh my gosh, what happened? Actually, we have to go to the Waitangi Tribunal because they made a, a decision without Māori at the table. So we had to understand those processes to actually make really good decisions um, and not emotional decisions, just saying, because most of ours were emotional. Um, but if we had the knowledge, I think that would have been better. So understanding those processes um, was the main challenge. Uh, and together with that were communication challenges, uh, internal communication within hapu, whanau, hapu, iwi, that was happening, uh, but some of it wasn't getting through to the right people. And then also communication from government agencies, uh, it was happening but it wasn't going to the right people. And then also communication with our lawyer. So trying to get them to understand, tell Māori, 
to apply that in a legal framework. Um, so that was really uh, one of the challenges. And so I've got there Te Runanga o Ngāti Awa. So Trona is the iwi authority for 22 hapu here. Well, not here, here, uh, across Whakatane. And we're a part of that framework in terms of Te Patuwai on Mōtiti. So Trona, being an iwi authority, uh, are used to leading these type of proceedings, fair enough. But for Te Patuwai, we asked them to uh, just support us and let us lead it because it was really important for the hapu to lead all of the discussions to do with Mōtiti and that uh, Trona needed to support and always be there for us. And I can say that they eventually did get to that position and they did support. Yeah, so there were role, understanding of the roles was major. Also funding issues, so I did say as a Waitangi Tribunal there were funding from the Crown to participate in the RMA, but it's not really just about that, it's also funding the people who were a part of the process, who have full-time jobs, and, and this is a full-time job as well. So trying to give back to the people who were doing the work for love, because really it was just, we were doing it for love, for, for our people and, and the island. So funding issues was a big thing. Trying to get petrol, because at the time I was living in Hamilton, trying to come back and forth all the time. Just giving petrol to everyone who was involved so they can travel around. Um, your basics, right, food, drink, all that stuff. So that was a major issue. Time frame issues are also a part of it as well. That was a challenge. Trying to hit the um, court filing timetable, that's a nightmare. Uh, that's a nightmare for a lawyer alone. Imagine for whānau hapu iwi. We, we don't actually work on timetables, you know, like that. So that was a major uh, challenge. Emotionally charged comments and decisions made, this is within Whāra Hapu Iwi, that was a challenge, a major challenge, and continues to be. And then the crux of the challenges that I've got there, which prioritises over the processes, is compromising our tikanga for the legal processes. And when I say compromise, it means... Um, knowing that we have to do things the tikanga way, but then we kind of put it aside to meet the legal process, which that's compromising um, from my view as well, as well as the komatua. It's, yeah, when you're in the middle of it and you're watching it, it's um, devastating, but that continues as well. And the reason why it continues is because the ship's still on the spiritual pathway back home literally still compromising the tikanga um, there for as long as it stays there. But I'm not trying to argue that, that point, I'm not meant to, but anyway. Where to from here? Possibly good governance um, for frameworks for monitoring Ōtaiti. Uh, good maintenance of Ōtaiti through education of the area and also for, for hapu and also better collaboration relationships uh, through communication, leadership and management. So that's what I mean with the regional council, whānau hapu, iwi, better relationships there. So we know what, what's happening. And then recommendations for Aotearoa. So as part of the research in law, our goals are to provide recommendations at the policy level. That's what we do as legal scholars. My recommendations um, from this research is inclusion of Te Tiriti principles uh, through the maritime strategy policy document. They don't have one, but they probably have one now, but back then they didn't have anything um, in place. Also establishment of permanent forum of tihanga experts in the maritime industry establishment of alternative dispute resolution processes in the maritime industry and um, then an establishment of permanent forum, forum of tikanga experts in the resource management industry and then education for all the staff in maritime 
um, industry and resource management. So I think these were these were the recommendations from the historical account of the MV Renner um, situation, but I can see now that it's, there was some movement of including it, but now with the change in government, yeah. there's nothing there. <laughs> so I'm still going to stick with the recommendations because we'll always need that in place to help, um, help Māori with anything to do with the environment. So that's actually my kōrero. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to ask questions. Thank you. Um, I remember at the time that the whole arena thing was unravelling, that it was incredibly confusing because we were just getting snippets through the media of what was happening and um, essentially it was a bit of a minefield yeah. literally for those who were looking on. So that's actually the the simplest breakdown I've ever oh, heard of it. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so thank you for that. You're very um, welcome. We are a little bit condensed for time to get through our three presentations, but I will take one question. So there's no, did you say under what yeah. legislation? Yeah. So there's no... How would you do it in a way to give it text as a, as a resolution? Ah, yeah, text? okay. So I've probably put it, I've missed it, but I'll put it into the legislation that's already been done. So as an alternative, putting it into policy document that connects to Maritime New Zealand, putting it through there, and then hopefully the industry will follow. But there's also the arbitration, um, there are other acts, for mediation outside of that, that you can write into the legislation a provision that connects it to Maritime New Zealand. So there are different ways of implement, implementing those processes. Um, you've just got to time it right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you Thank again you. Um, for coming and sharing that with us today. Cool. Kia ora. Thank you.